Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Dr. Timothy Clark, founder and CEO of Leader Factor, a leadership consulting and training organization headquartered near Salt Lake City, Utah. And he is an international authority in the fields of senior executive development, strategy acceleration, and organizational change. Dr. Clark earned a triple degree as an All-American football player at Brigham Young University. He completed his doctorate in social science at Oxford and was both a Fulbright and British research scholar. Dr. Clark is the author of five books on leadership, including his newest release, The Four Stages of Psychological Safety, Defining the Path to Inclusion and Innovation. Tim, it is an unbelievable honor to have you on the podcast today. It's a pleasure to be with you, Mark. Thanks very much. I want to jump right into your latest book and, um, and, and what it is and what, what its basic outline is. What is the four stages of psychological safety? Well, maybe we, we back up. Let's talk about psychological safety to begin with. It sure. means in a very basic sense that if you go into a social setting, you're not going to have fear that you're going to experience negative or adverse consequences. So a very simple way to say it is it's not expensive to be yourself. Mm. And in the book, what I try to do is excavate the concept. So let's understand how this concept really works. And as it turns out, it works according to, it's a stage-based phenomenon, mm -hmm. meaning that as we interact with people in, on teams, in organizations, at home, regardless of the social setting, you're gonna progress through these four stages. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully you do, right? We yeah. don't always, right. but the hope is that we will. Yeah. And so uh, let me, I'll just briefly outline the stages. So stage sure, one sure. is inclusion safety. And this is always the starting point. It's the foundation. Inclusion safety means that you go into a social setting, a team, an organization, wh wherever, you feel included, you feel accepted, you feel a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And this is always where we start because this is the first natural human need. This is what we, this, the instinct is, that's what we want first. So there's a sequence to it. Mm -hmm. After that, we move to stage two, which is learner safety. Learner safety means we can engage in the learning process, ask questions, give and receive feedback, mm -hmm. experiment, make mistakes. And we're not going to be punished or marginalized or embarrassed in that process. Yeah. So we're, we, we, we feel safe to, to learn and do the things that learning entails. Then we move to the third stage, which is contributor safety. And again, we're following this natural sequence. Once we learn, the next natural human instinct is to use what we learn, to apply what we learn. We want to make a difference. So stage three is that. Contributor safety means that we feel safe to contribute as a full-fledged member of the team. And that we're, again, we're gonna be safe in that process. Mm -hmm. That we can make a difference. We can use all of our acquired knowledge, skills, abilities, experience, right? Yeah. Okay, then we go to stage four. And this is where it gets perhaps most fascinating of all. Stage four is what we call challenger safety. Challenger safety means that we can challenge the status quo, again, without jeopardizing our personal standing or reputation. Now, so I want you to, to think that we've to, to realize that as we've moved through these four stages, mm -hmm. we're following the natural sequence of human needs, but we're also climbing a ladder of vulnerability. Mm. So by the time you get to stage four, challenger safety, you are at the highest point of personal risk, exposure, and potential for loss. So your vulnerability is at the, at the top rung of that ladder. Wow. And so therefore your psychological safety has to be at the highest level to protect you in that act of vulnerability to challenge the status quo. If you don't have it, you're not going to do it. 
right? Wow, yeah. Okay, so that's kind of a brief outline of how the stages work. And that, where did that come from? It came from both quantitative and qualitative research. Yeah. So for example, in one of our surveys at the very beginning, we said, so as far as we can see, when people interact in, on teams in social settings, what do they do? They do four main things. They connect, mm -hmm. they learn, they contribute, and they challenge. Which one do you do first? And overwhelmingly, people said, well, we want to, we want to connect first. We right. want that sense of belonging first. So it's through that empirical research that we were able to discover the sequence of the stages, right? Inclusion, learner, contributor, challenger. Hmm. You, know, you know, one of the things that really strikes me about your work it aligns very well or, 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 or analogous in an analogous fashion to uh, Maslow, to Maslow's mm -hmm. hierarchy. Was that, was that an influence of, of your work at all? Yeah, absolutely. So we did a complete literature review mm. of, of need-based models. And, and as you know, in the 40s, Maslow said, as soon as the survival needs are met, mm. the next stage, he called it, we're going to seek belongingness needs. Mm -hmm. We're going to seek to satisfy those belongingness needs. So yes, um, so we took into consideration uh, his model. We looked at um, the great psycho psychologist, uh, Carl Rogers. We looked mm -hmm. at uh, um, social psychologist, Herbert Simon from Carnegie Mellon. We, we, did, we did a complete literature review to understand, to, to inform us. And then we, we used that and we looked at that and then we looked at our empirical data and we tried to make sense of it because what are we doing? We're in the pattern recognition business. Yeah. We're trying to understand the dominant pattern. And so the four stages represents that pattern. Mm. In your, in your book, you, you discussed several companies um, that, that failed to innovate. Um, tell us a little bit about some, some of those companies, some of those now defunct companies, and, and where, where they may have gone wrong. Sure. So if take any company that has died. So it, it could be Toys R Us or Blockbuster or Palmer. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Sure. But the common pattern, if you do a post-mortem analysis of failure, the common pattern is that the organization stopped adapting to its competitive environment. Mm -hmm. But the question is why? If these are organizations filled with highly intelligent people, so why would they, why, why after many years of success, would they stop adapting? How, did, how is it that they lost their adaptive capacity? Yeah. And the, the conclusion that we come to over and over again is that the leaders became willfully blind. Wow. Now, how did they become willfully blind? They allowed themselves to become isolated and insulated. Hmm. And they would not allow local knowledge that comes from the field, that comes from the shop floor, that comes from the customer interface. They would not allow that local knowledge to circulate up into the organization. The way that an organization stays adaptable is that it is constantly circulating the feedback that is coming from its stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. stakeholders are constantly telling you how you're doing. Yeah. If you stop circulating that, you cut that off and you lose your adaptive capacity. And so what happens is if leaders begin, if they become arrogant, right, that arrogance becomes an occupational hazard. Wow. They stop listening to people. They push the fear button. So if they push the fear button in their organizations, so let's go back to psychological safety. Mm -hmm. As soon as the leader pushes the fear button, it triggers what we call the self-censoring instinct. Mm. And every human has one. And as soon as someone triggers or activates your self-censoring instinct, what do you do? 
Well, you retreat, you withdraw into a mode of personal risk management. Mm -hmm. You're trying to preserve yourself. You're trying to avoid loss, which is a completely normal and natural thing to do. Right. right. So as, as yeah. soon as leaders begin to use fear as a mechanism, they don't understand how catastrophic that really is. Mm. They begin to lose their ability, their, their adaptive capacity. So psychological safety is crucial to all of this, Mark, right? Because it provides the lubricating oil of collaboration, which is what we need to process what's going on inside the organization mm -hmm. and what's going on outside the organization so that we can then respond. We can maintain our adaptability. So psychological safety ultimately is directly related with your ability to, to stay, to remain competitive. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to bring psychological safety into an organization at scale? Like some of the, the companies that you talk yeah. about, they, they were large organizations like Toys R Us, Blockbuster. I mean, these are, these are not small companies. I mean, it's, it would be easy to do it on a team, even you know, at, at, at a business unit level where you have maybe even a few hundred people, but to bring it to scale where you have thousands, maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, is that possible? It, it, it's a brilliant question. Uh, the answer is yes, but mm -hmm. it's difficult. Let mm -hmm. me tell you why. So yeah. to, to maintain psychological safety, you have to establish norms. Mm -hmm. Norms are patterns of behavior mm -hmm. that we use as we interact. Every team, every organization, every social collective has norms. Yes. So if we go back to... Edgar Schein from MIT, really the father of organizational culture. He said, as soon as humans begin to interact, the norms start to appear. <laughs> right. Now, the, right. so the question is, are we going to form norms by design or by default? Mm. Do we say this is what we want and we deliberately try to, to design the norms or do we just kind of let it happen? Yeah. So, so back to your question, you can't do it, but you have to approach culture by design. You have to be deliberate in identifying, modeling, and reinforcing the norms that you want. Mm -hmm. And then those norms can spread out. Those norms are scalable, but they can only be scalable. So first of all, they have to be identifiable and they have to be clear. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's the starting point. Right. But then leaders have to do two things. They have to model those norms mm -hmm. and reinforce those norms with accountability. If one of those two things doesn't happen, it'll never happen. Wow. So you have to model and you have to hold people accountable to those. Mm. And there's nothing that can compensate if you don't do those two things. Mm -hmm. So, for example, culture exists at several levels, right? We have course enterprise level culture we have subcultures we have micro cultures at the level of a team that's right yeah well if you take 10 teams those teams each will they'll be they'll be different in, in terms of their cultural patterns right and those cultural patterns more than anything else will reflect the leader mm. and so what if you have 10 teams uh seven are following the norms that you've established for the entire organization, mm -hmm. but three are not. So you're gonna to start to see this distribution and you're gonna see some teams that, that have a microculture that is not living up to what, to the aspirations of the organization, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see, is it possible? Yes, it's possible. You've got to have clarity from the top about what we stand for and how we're going to work together. And then at the team level, you've got to have people that are modeling mm -hmm. and holding people accountable.
what are some positive examples that you've seen of organizations that were able to do this at the kind of scale that we're talking about? Let me give you one. Mm -hmm. So let's take the Mars Corporation. Mm, okay. Uh, M&Ms, Snickers, you know, they make all kinds of, of, of products that we're familiar with. Of course. This is a, quite an incredible uh, case study, pretty astonishing. In the 1970s, they established their five principles mm -hmm. to, to govern the culture. In the 1970s, and one of those was to have a healthy disrespect for the status quo. Wow. I find that incredible that in the, in the 1970s, yeah. they were so enlightened that they tried to get that into the DNA. Yeah. And, and, and to a large extent, they did. Mm -hmm. And they were successful. And they were able to perpetuate that culture uh, generation after generation. To me, that's a, an incredible example of a scalable culture mm -hmm. that tries very hard to nurture and foster psychological safety. Wow. In your book, you discuss Google actually, and, and how they did a study of 180 of their teams. Uh, tell us a little bit about what they found. Yeah, they studied 180 of their teams for, I think it was about two years, and they're, they're yeah. trying to figure out what are the patterns of the, of the highest performing teams, because mm -hmm. we want to scale that. Right, well, right. Whatever that magic is, whatever that secret sauce is, you know, we want everybody to have that. Yeah. So they studied that and they landed on five factors that were the defining characteristics. This, by the way, is called Project Aristotle. That's what they named it. Yeah. And they landed on five principles that were the defining characteristics of their most high performing teams. Number one characteristic was none other than psychological safety. Wow. That was number one. Wow. And so what we have found, Mark, in, in, in our own research is that your team, you can be exquisitely blessed with every resource, mm -hmm. guidance, direction, vision, uh, resources, uh, like uh, expertise, the most brilliant people, yeah. uh, money, uh, everything. Yeah. If you lack psychological safety, there's nothing else that can compensate for that gap, that hole, nothing. Because as I said, that is your lubricating oil mm. for collaboration. So if you don't have that, what are you going to do? And that's why we often find teams of, of brilliant people and, they, and they're not performing. Mm. Because they can't get along, right? Wow. They, they can't get along. They can't work together. That's absolutely fascinating to me. Because I think if, if, I, if I understand what you're saying correctly, that you could have a team that has everything going for itself, you know, as intelligence, money, leadership, resources, everything, everything, go, everything going for it, right? And then you have this other team, maybe they're small, they're scrappy, maybe they're not the most, you know, the most intelligent, maybe they're just smaller in numbers. But if I understand you correctly, that that, that smaller team, if they have psychological safety, will outperform that well-resourced team every time. It, it usually will. Let's think about what, where psychological safety comes from. Mm. Psychological safety is a function of two things. Number one, respect. Mm. Number two, permission. It's the intersection. It's the fusion of those two things that gives us a, a, a certain level of psychological safety. It could be low, could be high, right? But it's that intersection, respect and permission. Mm -hmm. And so if those people on the team, yeah. if they give that to each other, the psychological safety just continues to climb. If yeah. they don't, regardless of how brilliant they are, they will struggle uh, because here's, here's what happens. And I talk about this in the book. Mm -hmm. The leader's job, the leader's primary job in a social setting uh, is to increase intellectual friction hmm. and mm -hmm. decrease social friction. Wow. 
right? Yeah. So you got to think about that. Why do we want intellectual friction? Intellectual friction is the great raw material that allows us to create value, mm. to solve problems, to come up with solutions, to innovate. So we need creative abrasion. We need constructive mm. dissent. We need ideas that are colliding and rubbing against each other. We need hard hitting dialogue and debate. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what does it take to enable and then preserve that process? Mm. It takes respect and permission. So we need the intellectual friction to go high. Yeah. And we need the social friction to stay low. If the, yeah. if the social friction goes up, at some point it will shut down the intellectual friction. I can see that. It'll be at a standstill because people yeah. can't work together. Now there's a tendency for the social friction to go up as the intellectual friction goes up. Why? Because we're human. Right. <laughs> right? We're very sensitive and we have egos and we have opinions and we're sure. just, we're, we're very sensitive and we're universally insecure. Mm. So, so the best leaders in the world are the ones that can increase the intellectual friction but reduce the social friction. Does that make sense? It does. It it's, does. Not, it's not easy to do, but it's possible. And we see cases of it that are incredible. In your book, and, and sort of aligned closely with that is, you know, in terms of the leader, you talk about uh, bowling lanes and gutters as well. T tell us a little bit about that concept. Okay, so that, <laughs> it's, it's the best way that I can come up with to explain that if you're moving if you're moving uh, through the four stages of psychological safety, then you're in the bowling lane. Mm -hmm. You're making progress. You're moving forward from stage to stage. You can get off, however, on one side or the other, right? There's a gutter on the left and there's a gutter on the right. Right. On one side, the gutter is what we call paternalism. Mm. Paternalism is a combination of high respect, generally, but low permission. Mm, so mm -hmm. maybe well intended, but I'm micromanaging you. Mm. I've got you on a short lease. I'm, a, I'm like a helicopter parent. Right, I pat right. you on the head and say, I love you. Don't touch anything. <laughs> right. That's, but we see this all the time. <laughs> right. It's right. Well intentioned yeah. people, benevolent people, but they don't know how to lead. Yeah. Right. They don't know how to delegate. They don't know how to create a scalable influence and impact. And so they're holding people back. And, and oftentimes they're well-meaning, but they're still holding people back. Mm -hmm. So that's paternalism. Yeah. The other failure pattern, the other gutter is exploitation. Exploitation is the opposite combination where respect is low but permission is high. Now, what would, what would possess a person to, 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 to have that kind of a combination? Well, think about it. Yeah. Respect low, permission high. That means that I want to extract the value that you're able to create, mm -hmm. but I don't really value you, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm not valuing you inherently. Yeah. I just value what you're able to produce. So this is exploitation. And unfortunately, in many organizations, we have actually normalized patterns of exploitation. For example, I'll give you some common ones, bullying, mm -hmm. public shaming, harassment, manipulation. These are all very common forms of exploitation wow. that in many organizations have become normalized. But the great thing about this, Mark, is that particularly with as the, as the millennials flood into the workforce yeah. is that they're saying, hang on a second, time out. Wait a second. I've come to this organization. I'm excited. I'm here to grow and develop and make a difference and make a contribution. Mm -hmm. They assume psychological safety as a term of employment. In other words, they wow. expect it. Wow. And this is a beautiful thing because mm -hmm. when they don't see it, or feel it or experience it. They're calling time out and they're saying, hang on a second. What is this? What's going on? <laughs> and if, <laughs> if they can't find psychological safety, they're just saying adios. Mm -hmm. Your most talented people 
in an environment of low psychological safety, you're going to bleed them out. Mm. They're not going to stay. And yeah. so there are two forces at work in organizations across the world that are exploding uh, the, the, the interest in psychological safety. One is the moral force, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a reaction against social injustice, which is saying inclusion safety, which is just stage one, mm -hmm. is a human right. Yeah. It's not earned, it's owed. So where is it? Because we all are entitled to it. Because just uh, by virtue of the fact that we're human. So that's the moral force. Mm -hmm. The other force at work is the competitive force. And the mm. competitive force is a response to market turbulence, which says it's more difficult than ever to remain competitive. I need, we need to innovate. Well, if we need to innovate, how do we create an incubator of innovation? Turns out you can't do it without psychological safety. So even if you're not a true believer in inclusion, mm. even if you still have your own biases mm -hmm. and prejudice, right? And you're struggling with that. Many people still acknowledge the importance of psychological safety just to innovate, just to be competitive. Mm -hmm. So it could be one side or the other, but these two forces are exerting themselves on organizations in a more powerful way than we've ever seen before. And that's what's exciting because as we look into the future, there's the real possibility that we can create much healthier, vibrant, dynamic, uh, happy mm -hmm. organizations. Over the last probably couple of decades at least, um, there's been a surge of diversity and inclusion initiatives in organizations you mentioned inclusion just in your previous response are they enough no mm. no of course not now the efforts are to be commended and applauded and we're very grateful for that yeah but what we're talking about is cultural transformation that has to occur mm -hmm. and it goes back to what i said earlier there are two things that have to happen to transform the culture particularly as we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. One is modeling behavior. Mm -hmm. Two is accountability. accountability. Those are the two pillars, right? And so the leaders have to model that behavior mm -hmm. and they have to hold people accountable when there's a violation. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't happen, all bets are off. And the DEI office unfortunately, is not going to make it happen. Yeah. Right? Because the DEI office cannot overcome positional power that doesn't want it. That's not, it's, it's not possible. Now, can they make gains in parts of the organization? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they can do much good and they need to keep going but we have some really fundamental work to do uh, and it starts at the top mm -hmm. and it has to start at the top. There's no back door to create this uh, deeply inclusive environment, right? You can't, you can't do that. How would you describe your prototypical or perfect leader? Well, I, I will begin by saying they come in all shapes and sizes and varieties and personalities and temperaments and dispositions. So that's the first thing to understand yeah. is that they are diverse by definition. Right. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> isn't that beautiful? So there's incredible diversity. Yeah. But then there are some shared attributes mm. uh, that take us to effectiveness. And um, I would begin with motivation and intent. So wh why do you want to, to, to lead, right? So you have to answer the why question uh, because the why reveals motivation. If you see leadership as a glittering path to your own rewards, you're not getting it. Right. It's, it's, it's actually not about you. So if you... 
if you came into the game with that thought, then you, uh, we're in trouble right, right out of the chute. We're in trouble because your intent is self-serving. And I can't skill build away your misguided intent. It's not going to happen. We can skill build till the cows come home and we're not going to get there because uh, your, your motives are, they're not clean. That's not why you're here. So um, that's, that's, but that's where we always begin. And then after that, it's, um, there, there are, there are common attributes that I think are very important. I think it's a combination, Mark, of character and competence. It's a, mm. it's a combination of those mm -hmm. two things. So let me, give you a, let me give your listeners a very simple framework for leadership. Yeah. So if we think about leadership as character and competence, then from those two dimensions, we can derive four combinations. Mm. So we can say high character, high competence, great leader. Mm -hmm. Right. This is a leader with incredible character and a leader that is very competent, very skilled, very able, very right. Uh, so that's that's great. So that's great. Let's let's go to the other extreme. Low character, low competence. Mm. That's pretty clear. Uh, failed leader. Mm -hmm. Right. You're in both in both categories. The character is the core the competence is the crust. So we have core and we have crust. So if you're weak on both, yeah. you're, 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 you're not going to do well. So you're failed. So those two are pretty, pretty clear. Okay. Now here's where it gets interesting. Yeah. Uh, high character. Yeah. Low competence. Hmm. High character, low competence. Yeah. What would you call a leader in that character in the in that category? So solid core, right? Solid mm -hmm. character, mm -hmm. weak competence. Hmm. So this is something for your listeners to think about. Yeah. So, so here's my any any response? Any any thought? I would say maybe someone who's charismatic, but not a lot of depth. Not a lot okay. of right. Yeah. So they're lacking the depth. So these are the people that I would be happy to go to lunch with. Right, right. But that's all. Yeah. yeah. You want to go to lunch? Great. I'll go to lunch. That's it. But am I going to follow you into battle? No. Mm. You don't have the chops, mm -hmm. right? You're a nice person and we can have lunch, but we're not going into battle together. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's the fourth category. Yeah. Low character high competence. So you have a liquid core, mm -hmm. right? You don't have the, you don't have the character, but you're, you have a solid, you have solid competence, depth, skill, mm -hmm. competency, experience, knowledge. Mm -hmm. You are very well equipped. So if you're low character, but high competence, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I I'm almost afraid to answer or that one, right? I, I always think, could they be criminal? Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. No, actually, that's true. So, the the term that I like to to describe this category is dangerous. Mm. You're dangerous. Yeah. You're clever. You're capable, but you're going to let us down because you're not anchored to any eth ethical creed, right? Mm, right. I just don't know when that's going right. to happen. Right, right. <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it's going to happen. You're right. dangerous. Mm. And that's, it's, that's a very difficult situation to be in when you have a leader like that. Yeah. Because they act, they're venal characters and they act like human vending machines. Mm -hmm. Put in enough money and you get what you want. Right. Because that, right, it's all economics to them. Mm -hmm. Leadership is not economics. Yeah. Leadership is about human beings. Mm -hmm. And you have to have 
deep respect and affection and concern for your fellow human beings. Your highest loyalty is to the human family. Yeah. If you don't have that, yeah. then um, it's going to be a tough journey, mm. I think. Yeah. yeah. That I, I, love, I love the framework, the, the, the simplicity of that framework, the character and competence uh, combinations, I think is just an absolutely brilliant um, common, uh, it's a brilliant way of outlining what leadership is, right? And I think it accommodates for the varying styles of people because, you know, as, as you said astutely a moment ago, you know, leaders are diverse, right? <laughs> Everyone's different. You, you take 10 teams, they, they would be, they would all have different cultures if, you know, if left alone uh, to the leader themselves. And I think it's a very elegant framework. You, you mentioned the human family. And so I wanna get out of the, the macro level of the human family and really drill down a little bit into the micro family. How can the four stages of psychological safety apply in the home? I guess, I guess my response to that, Mark, is that perhaps this is where it has its greatest and most profound expression mm. in the home because the most, the most profound expression of culture is in the home. It's at the family unit. Yeah. level. That's your basic building block of society. But it's, it's not easy because you're raising children right. and parenting, if we think about it, is the gradual transfer of ownership mm -hmm. to the child, right? We're, right? we're helping the child grow and learn and develop, become a well-adjusted human being and be able to go out into society and make a contribution. Mm -hmm. That's what we're hoping for. We're hoping to raise uh, honest, talented, hardworking, contributing people. Right. Uh, so we, we need psychological safety in the home. Otherwise, we have a stultified environment and it's in the home where we build self-efficacy in children. It's the most important place mm. for building that confidence and that self-efficacy yeah. so that the child can then go out into the world and uh, battle, mm -hmm. deal with adversity, overcome adversity, develop resilience, and persistence mm -hmm. and stamina and courage. Where, where do all of these attributes, where, where do they begin? They begin in the home. Yeah. Uh, integrity, work ethic, all of these things. Mm -hmm. But obviously that's not gonna be a smooth process, right? So I'm a father, my right. wife and I, we, 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 we're still, we're working at it and, and we're not <laughs> perfect. Right. But I've got to tell you, you know, I've worked with, I don't know how many executive teams, mm. but the, but there's been nothing more challenging than raising a family, but yet there's nothing more rewarding. Right. So we try, we, we've got to create psychological safety. So again, inclusion safety. Mm -hmm. Does every child feel loved? Mm-hmm. Constantly, even when correction needs to happen, right. perhaps especially when correction needs to happen. Right. Do we have favorite children? Of course not. We, yeah. it, it, notions like that are just divisive. Mm -hmm. We love our children with equal affection. Inclusion safety is always there. How about learner safety? Yes. They have to learn and grow and that's constant. So we've got to nurture learner safety. One of the, one of the, um, one of the case studies, uh, statistics that I give in the book, Mark, is that every 26 seconds in the United States of America, a student drops out of high school. Mm. Wow. That's a tragedy. Yeah. What we know from the research is that barring a legitimate learning disability, most of these students that drop out have 
the ability to do the academic work. Mm -hmm. What happened? Mm -hmm. They didn't have the love, the support, the guidance, the encouragement. So they lost confidence and they, wow. they called it quits. That's wow. what happened. Yeah. That's a tragedy. So what do we know about learning? Learning is an intellectual and an emotional process. They are interwoven. You mm -hmm. cannot detach those two aspects of the learning process. They go together. And so if you have an emotionally bruised child, you have an impaired learner. Mm -hmm. The child cannot learn the way he or she is capable of learning. So that's learner safety. Then how about contributor safety? We need contributor safety. So for example, um, one of the things that my wife Tracy and I have done is that we've, we've taken great pains to help our children learn a work ethic. Mm -hmm. If they don't learn a work ethic, when they get out into the world, what will they try to do? They'll try to take shortcuts. Right. And so what we preach to them is that there are no easy answers and there are no shortcuts. Don't even look for them. We don't do shortcuts. Right. right? Uh, find the price and pay the price. If mm -hmm. you want something, find the price and pay the price. There's no shortcut. Yeah. And if you start to deceive yourself and you start to be tempted that you're going to take a shortcut, you're going to get stung. Now, the day of reckoning may, may come early, it may come late, but it's going to come yeah. because there are no shortcuts. So that's contributor safety. That's then we get to challenger safety. Now, here's the hard one, Mark, right? That's challenger the hard safety. One. Right. Especially right. when you're in a home filled with teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you got your children telling you, right dad, you're wrong. And why are you doing this? And this doesn't yeah. make sense. And this is stupid. Mm -hmm. Have we had those conversations? Oh, yeah. 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 And have we had, yeah. have we tried to have tolerance for candor, which is one of the concepts that, that, that we talk about in the book related to challenger mm -hmm. safety? Yes, we need tolerance for candor. But so, so here's the tricky part. And it's the tricky mm -hmm. part in the, in the workplace, too. The leader is responsible to patrol the boundaries of respect. Mm, mm -hmm. If there's a violation of respect, wow. oh, got to pull you back. Because right. we don't do disrespect. We don't get personal. Mm -hmm. We don't make personal attacks. Everything comes crashing down if we allow that behavior. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're in the home, on a team, in the workplace, at yeah. school. You patrol the boundaries of respect. Mm. At the same time, though, even when it hurts as a parent, you, you want to tolerate that, that, that candor, mm -hmm. that dissent, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you, you got, you've got to let them express and verbalize and um, vent and release. Yeah. And you, you got to be able to handle that. You got to right. be able to accommodate that. And I, I imagine on some level, you have to allow them to vent and release and not take that personally. Right. <laughs> right. It just like, there's a, there's a bit of a, That's there's right. a bit of a thick skin. We as parents have to have that That's when right. they challenge us, you know, they, you, you really do. You really do. And that's where <laughs> humility comes in. Yeah. yeah. You, really, you, you have got to, yeah. you've got to manage the ego. Mm. And because it 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 serves no good purpose in yeah. leadership. Yeah. No. Thank. You. That is absolutely amazing. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on was because I felt like this concept really does reson. It, it resonates not only in business but also in the home as well. Now I want to. I want to go macro again. Really macro. I want to go outside of uh, any home, any business. I actually want to talk about the broader environment. Mm -hmm. And right now, as of the recording of, of this podcast episode, we're in the middle of some pretty significant circumstances. We're in the, we're in the middle of you know, COVID-19. We're in the middle of social unrest. Um, we're in the middle of wildfires happening in different places. You know, and and we're, we're also experiencing uh, 
a presidential election all at the same time, you know? So you, there's, there's the dueling campaigns in the midst of all of this, all of this upheaval. Um, what, I, I'm really curious through the filter of psychological safety, just some of your observations about, about the, the, the and, and I know you'll probably have to be careful <laughs> about the current you know, administration, yeah. just kind of like some of the things that are happening in sort of broad brushstrokes. I'm just I'm really curious sure. to what you think about all these things that are happening. I'll make a couple of comments, Mark. Mm. And I, I'm not, I don't need to be partisan on this at sure, all. Sure, sure. Because that's, that's not even relevant. So in light of what I just said, let's think about the same concept mm. that we, we patrol the boundaries of respect. Mm. The, the level and the amount and the magnitude of incivility that we have allowed to enter our public discourse is 100% unacceptable. Vehemently agree. So let's go back to stage one, inclusion safety. Right. Inclusion safety is a human right. Mm. It's based on the inherent worth of a human being, that, that, that we have dignity. Dignity means that you are worthy of respect. That's what di dignity means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the pr principle that governs stage one, inclusion safety, is that worth precedes worthiness. Mm. We can have worthiness conversations as it relates to your performance and your skills and your competency, that's fine. But when it comes to inclusion, it's not negotiable. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is a non-negotiable. Yeah. We, we are not going to have a discussion about whether you're worthy of inclusion. Mm -hmm. You're entitled to inclusion based on two criteria. Number one, you're human. Right. Number two, you do not threaten us with harm. Mm -hmm. If you can meet those two criteria, you, are, you deserve, you're entitled to inclusion safety. Mm -hmm. I'm morally obligated to invite you into my society. Mm -hmm. Now, do we, have, <clears throat> do we have deep differences? in our society, yes we do, in terms of beliefs and values and ideology and philosophy, we do. But we have to be able to talk about those things with respect and civility. Remember what I said earlier, that we need intellectual friction, mm -hmm. we need to keep the social friction down, which allows us to continue the dialogue in a productive way. Yeah. We're not doing that. Mm -hmm. We allow the social friction to rise with the intellectual friction. And then what happens? We reach impasse. We reach stalemate. Mm -hmm. And we're not able to make progress. It is 100% unacceptable to make personal attacks, uh, to engage in the kind of disrespectful un uh, discourse that we hear, it's 100% unacceptable. It cannot be justified on any grounds, mm -hmm. on any grounds, it just can't. And this is where we need to pull ourselves back and say, you know what, I feel strongly about this. I have convictions about this. Okay, that's fine. But your highest loyalty is to the human family. Yeah. You, there's no justification Again, I can say it again and again and again. You cannot justify it on any grounds. Mm. You can't. And we have gone astray. Yes. We are way off in the alfalfa in this area. <laughs> and we, we need to change. We need to reform. We need to self-diagnose and self-correct. It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. We should not be speaking or treating each other this way. What is one piece of advice that you would give to the world? Oh, man. You ask some really uh, tough questions, don't you, Mark? <laughs> I have an embarrassing number of them, that's for sure. <laughs> one piece of advice. Mm. Well, I will, offer, I will offer this thought. Mm. 
it pertains to leaders, but then who's a leader? Mm. First of all, let me preface my, my thought by saying that the best synonym for leadership in the English language is the word influence. Mm. Leadership is about influence. Now, of course, we're talking about influence toward worthy, meaningful goals. Yeah. With that definition in mind, who's a leader? Everyone is because we, we are all radiating influence to each other. My thought is that in, in your influence as an individual, you are either leading the way or you are getting in the way. Mm. You are not a neutral actor. You're never neutral because there's no off switch for your influence. You can't, you can't turn it off. Yeah. So what you need to think about is how am I exerting my influence and toward what end mm -hmm. am I exerting my influence? What, what, what am I doing? You're either leading the way or getting in the way. Mm. And I think that that's a sobering thought that we all need to reflect on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What is the greatest lesson that you've learned in your life, whether in life personally or in business? The greatest, well, I, I don't know if there's one, but I'll give you one. I'll give you one of probably several. One is sure. that we are all ignorant and we are all interdependent. Mm. And that is why we need humility. Yeah. So humility is the unresented acknowledgement that we don't know a lot mm. and we need each other. Yeah. So that's one, one lesson that I have learned uh, because in my own journey, I, have, I still have a lot to learn and a lot to change and a lot to improve, which I'm very happy to say. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you want most for your life? I want to, so here's my definition of success mm -hmm. to be able to allocate my scarce resources, yeah. my time, my energy, my attention and my, and my money yeah. and my health. Really there's five. Sure. I want to be able to allocate those scarce resources based on my values and my goals if I can do that, then I will be able to look back with some peace and some, some solace, some satisfaction on the way that I have lived my life. Yeah, that's beautiful. If I misallocate mm. those scarce resources toward things that I really don't believe in, then that's going to, that's going to create regret for me. Mm. I don't want to do that. So at this point, I want to open it up for you to share any final thoughts that you have with me and with uh, my listenership. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think would be helpful for us to know? I'll, I'll leave you one parting thought, maybe, Mark, and that is, and for your listeners, yeah. and that is to approach leadership to lead as if you have no power. I think increasingly we need to think about leadership yeah. as uh, divorced from title, position, or authority. Mm -hmm. So let's clear the decks of those artifacts which organizations give us. Right. And let's not worry about those things. Mm -hmm. uh, let's be agnostic to those things. And then we can see much more clearly both what leadership is and how we're doing. So I think that helps us have a much cleaner mirror that we can hold up and yeah. that can take, that can help us in our, in our journeys. Yeah. Yeah. This has been an absolutely amazing interview, Tim. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for your time, for the insights and wisdom that you shared. I, I, I can't wait to share this with other people. Um, it, it, you, you, what you shared I, needs to be heard by everyone. Honestly, every human being on the planet needs to hear what, what, you, have to, um, what you have to say. Uh, where can people find you online? Sure. Well, uh, our website is leaderfactor.com. 
And for your listeners, feel free to follow me on Twitter, Timothy R. Clark, or LinkedIn, Timothy R. Clark. Um, love to hear from you. And uh, yes, yeah, so certainly reach out if you'd like to. Thank you. And, and, and to everyone watching and listening, please follow Tim. It, it, go to his website. He's got some amazing resources there. Really dig into his work. I can tell you, in, in my humble opinion, I feel like he's the, he's the Stephen Covey of this generation. So, um, Tim, thank you so much for, for being, being with me today. Thanks, Mark. It's a pleasure.